This is almost as bad as the first day of school when no one says a word. <laughs> if you're there. You ever played the game where you have people give like the three best adjectives to describe you? Peripatetic is the one that they give me, so I need a remote because I tend to. All set? Mike has like a very small range of where it picks up. If you're out all the way over here. But I'm very loud. They're working off like a, a gate. If you're not talking loud enough, and it's very, very, pre I don't, I don't understand why they keep it so low. Well. <laughs> it's okay. I, I don't. Um, then it may just not be good because I can't sit still on parapet. Okay. Then let me, let me just scoot one of these out that way so that I can get a little bit more. Right, that's why I sort of push. I, I will probably need to go back to my paper, so I might sit there a little bit, which is why I left one here.
Okay, so we'll get started today because they told me to try and keep it on time and we start ourselves and I'm trying to do a good thing for lawyers. So I'm Deb Cohen and I am, uh, as I was saying downstairs, anyone in the q and I'm from a family of half lawyers and half teachers and I'm the middle of three dark girls, so I split the baby. Um, I have been teaching for over 20 years. We're going to just stop at that. Um, I'm never going to say more than that. I'll always maybe, you know, I'm going to stick with, I've been teaching more than 20 years. It's still enough. I've been directing academic success um, at UDC for a couple of years and at other places before that. So I have been spending a lot of time thinking about teaching and learning. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about digital immigrants teaching digital, digital natives. And I want to start by asking you to keep in mind that our assumptions are our windows on the world. And if we don't occasionally take the smudges off of our assumptions, clear a few windows off, we often go in with preconceived notions that we're not even focused on. So as we start today, I'm going to ask that you please think about polishing a few windows. I know most of us don't do windows. but. Clean a few windows off. So if, if anyone says they do windows, I'm inviting you to my house. Um, clean a few windows off and think about it because we want to try and look at things as from as many perspectives as possible. I mean, I'm a law professor. I want to tell people there's no right answer. The answer is usually, it, usually it depends. Um, and that usually depends on your perspective. And one of my major goals is getting my students to see multiple perspectives. So I try to do this myself regularly too. So my question where we all start is, are you a digital native or a digital immigrant? And by the way, I don't believe on stage on the stage. I believe in interactive. I always tell my students, if you don't want to talk or nod your own head, bring a bobblehead. But since you didn't have an opportunity to bring your favorite bobblehead, you're just going to have to exercise your necks a little bit. OK, there's yes, there's no, and there's the circular nod that you don't want to admit. You might know something about it, so you just avoid eyes and contact. Okay, we all understand the motions. All right, so are you a digital native or a digital immigrant? We're going to talk a little bit about this, but before I start down my winding road about this, I want to know how many of you think you are a digital native? Digital natives, Ray, be proud! Digital native, I've got one, two, digital three, four, come on. If you're a digital, stand up for your, we have some digital immigrants. This is very sensitive. Any immigrants in the room? Any digital immigrants in the room? I know it's not politically correct to identify right now. Are you an immigrant? That's really a loaded question. That's OK. After I'm done with it, I'm going to ask where you fall on the spectrum. So I'm just being politically incorrect all the way around. So the question is, digital immigrant or digital native? Immigrant? Native. Immigrant? Yes, I learned to type on one of those. Yes, I remember those phones. The Ritz actually has one set up on each floor that looks like Pro and Madonna with a push button. <laughs> that was my niece and my friend's kids, right? They're playing on the computer before they're learning to, they know how to use the remote control better than I do. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference. And I'm going to talk about generational gaps, but I'm going to say right outside, these are stereotypes. These are generalizations. And as we all know, generalizations are over-inclusive and under-inclusive. So of course, there are going to be people who are on the edges. OK, so baby boomers. Technically, depending on which group they put you at, I'm either a late boomer or early Gen Xer. Okay. I've learned not to be worried about my age. I am what I am. I'm a late boomer, early Gen Xer, but I won't ask you to identify publicly, but self-identify. Okay? Where do you fall? The reason I put this up there is because we all are raised in an era of, era of technology. Okay? Technology is what is new in your lifetime. Otherwise, it just is. Otherwise, it just is. So looking around, I seem to have a fairly young crew here. Either that or my perspective has changed. And most of you are in the Gen X millennial crowd. I have a few people who are boomers with me, but, but not a lot. So the question is, do you remember these things, OK? My 
parents or grandparents would talk about times before that. They, they remember getting their first telephone or, or that first airplane. Or my grandfather, who grew up in uh, Manhattan, born in 1898 in Manhattan, would talk about the gas lamp lighters and you know, Harlem being farmland. Right? So he was there for the building of things like parts of the New York subway and, and you know, things that I take for granted. You know, transportation, the, the differences of when I was young and you had to go get on a plane, that was a big deal. There weren't a lot of choices. And you got into your best clothes knowing you got on an airplane in, in sweatpants. Um, you know, we had a turntable. I actually originally remember the one where you put it on with the, with the lever and it would drop down and play. You could stack records. You could stack your 45s if you had the little disc in the middle. Yeah, some of you don't have probably never seen a 45. Um, what? 78. 78, that's what I mean. <laughs> So, some of the easiest ways to think about this is the telephone. Bell, and we went from that party line to that corded telephone to that cordless telephone. You know, even as early, as recently as my niece, who's about 25, she, one day I'm talking to my older sister on the phone, and she was about five at the time, and she said, Mommy, come here. And my sister said, Can't, I'm on the phone. Bring it with you. She was on the corded line in the house. You can't bring it with you. No comprehension of what that would be, right? Because in her life, phones always moved. So what you're born with just goes with you. And what is new to you is technology. And Jill Smith did another presentation on transliteracy, and she talked about the fact that it all really exists, we just may not be used to it. Or, and there are huge differences between socioeconomics and rural and urban and all kinds of things. So I'm overgeneralizing. And I will acknowledge that several times. So I don't know which of the favorite of oh, TV, OK, growing up. We started out with the black and white, where you had to get up and run and turn the channel. I think we've all gained weight since then because we've lost all those steps. Of course, there weren't as many channels, so maybe not because we didn't have to change it as often. You know, I remember growing up with about seven stations. New York, born and bred, anyone? Yep. That's Channel 2, NBC Channel 4. Channel 5 was Fox, I think. Um, what? ABC was Channel 7, Channel 9 was WOR, Channel 11 was WPIX, and Channel 13 was BS. Yes. That was it. We had seven stations. We had seven stations. <laughs> we, I was in the New York metro area. I, I was. But I remember the black and white TV evolving into the color TV and the remote control and not needing bunny ears anymore because cable came in. And suddenly there are 256 channels, and now there are 2,056 channels. So again, the big screen, the H, the 3D TV. OK, I, I'm still on the plain flat screen. I haven't moved that far. So where are you on this trend? How do you fit in? Some people don't like generations. So being someone who likes multiple perspectives, I'm going to give you a different way to look at this whole thing, digital native, digital immigrant. Put yourself on the spectrum. Are you an avoider? Now, most people in law schools can find at least one avoider in their law school, someone who will not turn on the computer. It's a book, a, uh, a doorstop. Okay? Are you a minimalist? You use exactly what you have to do, but you don't like it. Now, I don't think we probably have many minimalists at a Cali Con. I really, really don't think Cali conferences get a lot of minimalists. But they exist out there, regardless of when they're born. There are people who just don't like the connectivity. A tourist, you go and you sort of gawk. Oh, how cool. Really interesting. Could be convenient, but I'm going home now. Or the enthusiast, oh, cool, something new to try. The innovator, the person who's taking it and doing the next step. Or So this is a different way to look at digital natives versus digital immigrants as a spectrum. And for those of us who don't like to be ageist, this might be a better way. But it doesn't really matter for my purposes. I want to ask why it matters in the law school. Why do we care about digital immigrants and digital natives in the law school environment? Does it really matter? Do you really care? 
I started with communications, right? Here's a picture. I was trying to use copyright free images, so you know they're limited. Um, there are a couple of my images that do have uh, notifications at the bottom because I did not find a copy free image one, so I just gave credit and I'm taking my fair use exception for my presentation. Um, so, communications, right? Okay, let's compare digital natives to digital immigrants. And before I change my phone, I'd like you all to tell me, what do you think the differences are between digital immigrants and digital natives? Now, I only think it's fair to give you a moment to think before we pair and share. Okay, so everyone take a moment, talk to your partner. If you don't know the person, introduce yourself first. But what are some of the differences between immigrants and natives? Immigrants and natives. Wow, I can be it now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't hear people talking. Oh, we're just going to go straight to sharing. Wow. Go ahead. Immigrants like to use the telephone, natives like to text. suggest that in the spectrum we could put email, I'm about to write email, you just go for email, and that before that there are people who prefer, and here I'm going to be a bit of a native, I'm a, a native. I'm going to say there are those who still are the very old school of only face to face. Do you have any of those colleagues or professors on your faculty who don't do students by email? They don't even do students by phone. They require them to walk into the office and do face-to-face. -face. Now, that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, and I'm going to try not to make judgments about it all, but they do tend to be products of their upbringing, products of their experiences, their socialization, what they're comfortable with. So what else might be differences between immigrants and natives? Two things. Well, then they say it's a product of what you eat and drink, because that also kills your memory. But, um, okay, so patience versus instant gratification. Now, in this case, um, in the communications, I'm definitely a face-to-face -face person. I'll do email. I think the hearing's going with age, so I don't like the phone so much as I used to. But I, I definitely am not on the texting end of the spectrum. On the immediacy natives, I'm probably a little bit too close to instant gratification for my own good. But OK, what else do we have? Differences between immigrants and natives. And again, you can see these are not boxes that we have. These are spectrums. versus screen. Okay, how many people in this room read on their computer, read on their laptop, read on their phone? How many people still prefer to read a novel, their fiction reading on a hardcover book uh, or a paperback book? How many people, when they're editing a piece of writing, like to print it out and edit on paper? Fewer. How many people like to do their news, the Washington Post, New York Times, Cleveland Daily, whatever, um, on the computer, or how many still get the paper delivered? How many people um, like to do their research on computers? How many people have been to a library in the last six months? How many of you are librarians? <laughs> how many non-librarians and not 
not to walk through and visit your library, but how many people have been to a library in the last six months to actually take out a book or do research? Okay. Actually, excuse me, to do research, go to the library, you may be asking about how to do the research online, right? So the library is still useful for finding out how to use Oh, it. training, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I have a list, and most of you have come up with a lot of it, but there are a few. Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't give it to you. <laughs> Any others that you think? Yeah, because there are a few other. I actually, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah. Uh, I would think maybe about collaboration. Collaboration. That's an interesting one. People say the digital natives are very collaborative. What about the immigrants? So less collaborative, more individualistic. Okay. So, anything else? Anything else? Yes. Natives are more apt to training. Natives are known as the trial and error. Trying not to be a New Yorker. When I teach, I have to tell my students there are three words I have a New York accent in. It always comes out in payment systems. Luckily, we don't teach that much anymore. Mira, era, and draw. <laughs> okay? Error. I put the, the, the key up on the first day so they'll know. But error. Trial and error versus more linear. So, again, how many of us Read the manual before we try to put the IKEA thing together. How many of us read the manual before we try to use a piece of software? How many of us try to organize the problem before we dive in? We have to do something for a faculty committee or a school committee. We have to plan, run, chair a committee. Anyone here chair a committee? Yeah. Do we try to do anything or do we just drop in and try trial and error? Do we plan? Do we do trial and error? So, you've gotten most of my list now. So, digital immigrants versus digital natives. Now, the terms came from Mark Prensky back in 2001, and Mark Prensky thought that we should totally, totally cater to the digital, to the digital natives. We should gamify education. We should recognize that their brains are different, and we should accommodate that. But there's been a lot of research in the interim that said, well, maybe some, maybe not. Are their brains changing? Probably. Our brains are always changing. They have discovered, unlike when I grew up, that you know you could kill off brain cells and you'd run out. That's, that's what they tried to scare us with when we were growing up, right? <laughs> you'll kill off your brain cells and then you'll be dumb. <laughs> I, I still have that, that notion that my brain cells die and I don't get new ones, right? Plasticity has shown in recent years that that's not true. We're constantly making new brain cells. Now, it may still be a good parental lesson, but we won't go there now. So in terms of this whole thing, um, our brains are constantly evolving, and we are adapting to our societies and, and what we do. So while the current studies show that people still retain more when reading paper, I suspect that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, it will evolve. I'm not sure because they show from PET scans that different parts of your brain light up from holding the paper and turning the page than from just reading on a screen. But I think that they're trying to adapt it so that the screens are different, so it looks more like and maybe we can train our brain to use different parts as we go. So the question is, what, what does this all matter in terms of it. Will our brains get better? I mean, there's this whole move to putting law school textbooks into digital form. I myself do my own materials because I cannot stand the price of legal books. Sorry, my legal publisher is present. I find it astronomical to ask my students to spend $200 to buy a case. So I have started putting together my own material using collaborative materials and creative commons, etc. I really worry because when they read it on screen, they do not seem to have gotten out of it what they, what I want them to, when they print it and read it. So I ask them to print it, I tell them it's still a lot cheaper than 
um, buying a book. And um, I'm not being as environmental as I might like because I think it makes a difference. But I think it might change <coughs> as the programs get better and they can literally highlight and put comments in just like I used to do in my textbook. So it will change. I don't think we're there yet. What other things in terms of why does this matter? How do our students read? How do they process materials? How do they communicate? How many of you have found that law students think that you should be available when and where they want you? Mm -hmm. Any of you have that issue? I mean, I'm pretty available. I mean, I live two miles from work. I go in on Saturdays and Sundays to meet with them. I have no problem with it. I do that they're part-time students. It's really the only time to meet them. But how many of you have found, well, you weren't here on Friday at 6 p.m. or Saturday at 8 a.m.? Well, but, you know, if you'd set up an appointment, I would have been. Mm -hmm. um, they are something of the instant gratification. They have been brought up with now. How many of you have ever had a law student walk in and say, I know you said X, but I found Y? Oh, right on the internet, I found Y, Y is right. I thought Y was right, I found Y on the internet, Y is right. Anyone find that resistance at all? A couple of you? It seems that this generation of students have grown up in a much more egalitarian world. A lot of them were raised calling their parents friends by their first name. Um, I know a lot of my friends were raised calling their parents friends aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so or miss so-and-so and mr. so-and-so. I grew up calling them Mr. Smith and Ms. Jones and I still call some of my parents, my parents' parents by that because I, I can't. Um, but so the question becomes what are these friends and what impact do they have and what should we be doing about it? Should we be accommodating them or not? And that's a really, really interesting question. So a couple more of the comparison. I liked, um, wrong way. I liked the, I liked this one. Um, this is copywriting someone else's screen. It's at the bottom somewhere. But I really liked it because I think it, it did. Conventional speed versus twitch speed. The content is one I really like. When I grew up, and when a lot of people in, in this room grew up, where did you go to do your research for a, a school paper? Did you get online and do the research online? Did you have to go down to the library? Well, I think that had a lot of impact. Like, you had to remember to do it when the library was open and you could get to the library. Like, maybe someone could drive you if you weren't lucky enough to live close by. You couldn't wait till 1 in the morning on Friday night because the library was closed. Yeah? And did anything make it into the library? Or was there already some vetting of sources? Did someone sort of say what books got published? So were they the right people? Were they vetting the right things? I don't know. But sources were pre-vetted. What happens today on the web? Where do most digital natives get their news? That's Comedy Central, and now that John Stewart has retired, I, I know people who don't get the news anymore. But these are the kinds of things. How do they know how to value what is appropriate for citing in a law school brief and what is not, besides what we teach them? The sequential, the linear versus the trial and error is said to be a factor of gamification. They grew up um, playing games. They trial and error learned how to make it to the next level. That was very effective problem solving for them. The hypertext that is available did not teach them to linearly progress. They could go down rabbit holes, and they do. The text versus graphics. I actually ascribe this to Sesame Street. Now, Sesame Street is a wonderful thing, but I have discovered, and I am pre-Sesame Street. My younger sister is post-Sesame Street, so at a young age, I got to watch Sesame Street. It was the only thing I was allowed to watch because she didn't watch it. But, <clears throat> sorry if you're there, Wendy. Um, so, I had to watch Sesame Street with her. Anyway, so, Sesame Street is designed as entertaining snippets. 30 seconds, sometimes even less, to two minute vignettes to teach them. Do we wonder why they'd like to be entertained? How 
did we teach them from the very beginning? How did we socialize them to learn? Let's count with the count, right? Let's sing the alphabet. Let's figure out which of these things is not like the other, and one of them just doesn't belong. Now, to compensate, I actually use this for an teaching analogy and distinction. I use Sesame Street. It works perfectly. And they all know, well, most of them know it. So, conventional speed, twitch speed. Just in time versus just in case, having to go to the library versus not. Hierarchical, respecting age, profession versus egalitarian. Long-term oriented versus immediacy. Individual versus group. These tend to be factors in large measure created in the digital environment that impact the divide in many a law school. And so, changing communication, changing libraries, changing education. What are we supposed to do about it? What are we supposed to do about it? And there are, again, a spectrum of options. There are those, again, like the Mark Prensky's of the word that say, cater to them, gamify. There are the traditionalists who say, they'll learn it my way. And then there's probably where we should be, which is somewhere in the middle, okay? <coughs> and what I'd like to spend the rest of our time today is talking about the kinds of things that we have to deal with where and why. So, I totally agree with everyone who says you have to take things where they come to you, right? We have to take our students where they are, because that's where they are. But we also have to take the legal profession where it is. Now, let's be candid. The legal profession is not exactly the most dynamic, fast-changing profession out there. I want to take issue with that. <laughs> Uh, we're going to accept that as a possibility that law as a tendency is retrospective. Gosh, look at the foundational principles. Stare decisis, precedent. We look backwards and we are slow to change. So we have a bunch of people who, like instant gratification, picture before text, trial and error and Collaboration, and they're walking into a profession which has been digitized, but is very text-oriented, okay? I mean, case books edit down cases. Have you ever gone back and looked at the full case? They can be pretty long. The people who control legal education, who control legal <coughs> practice of law, who control legal decisions, judges, senior lawyers, directors of programs, and deans and law professors tend to be of the former spectrum, while more and more students, not all, are of the latter. That's a battle for me. They walk into law school and they want it now, and they don't think that that person up there in the front of the classroom is anything special, they're, they're equals with them. I don't know any of the professors in here. I have students who walk into class now and say, hey, Deb, that takes me back. You've never met me. You're going to be in my class. You haven't even introduced yourself yet. And your emails to me or your, your introduction is, hey, Deb, I didn't think I looked that young anymore. Um, so what do I do? They don't want to learn, but to be truthful, we can't just do it their way because we're training them to go out into a profession that doing it that way will not be successful for them. If they walk into a courtroom and say to the judge, hey, Phil, they're going to have a problem. The judge will generally not appreciate that. If they think they can try arguments on a trial and error basis, they're going to lose for their client and commit malpractice. If they think that they're going to get their answers when and where they want it, opposing counsel has news for them. It's just not going to work for them that 
way. And so I think that we have a duty to try to bridge the gap. I tell them, some of the things you want to do are amazing and wonderful, and I look forward to watching you help the profession evolve, hopefully more speedily than it has sometimes in the past. But it's very hard to change the profession from outside of it. You generally want to become a valued member of it and then change it from within, having built up your credibility of bringing good things and always delivering good things. So let's take your example and try it. Do they believe me? Some yes, some no. So I've been thinking about a lot what I can do in my classroom, in my school, to help bridge the gap. Now, before I give you my list, I'm interested to hear some of the things that you have either observed or dealt with, because otherwise, you know, you all start falling asleep about 20 minutes into 30 minutes into a presentation, and I believe in keeping everyone awake. Okay, so have any, is this resonating with anyone? Remember, you don't have to speak, but we at least have to exercise the neck muscles, yes? No, all right, I'm going to get all those circular knots because you don't want to. Yes, sir. My impression is that we're, you said to me is if you're operating on a lot of stereotypes, and maybe some of this is truth in stereotypes, but it seems to me the students are paying $50,000 a year plus, and while they may come in wanting to be entertained, they may want short YouTube clips and two-minute things, at the end of the day, they really want intellectual rigor, they realize they're coming to a, an environment where they're preparing to get into a profession. So I think there's a, a tendency to think that maybe we have to coddle them, but I don't think they want to be coddled. And my impression is that many of the students come in that they've learned in this digital native style, but that they really want to be challenged. And okay. my, my sense is when I teach legal research, advanced legal research, that when I suggest that maybe they might want to look at statutes and research in print rather than online, they may not believe me at first, but I think when they get into the real world, they come back and they say, you know, I think you were right. Okay, other thoughts. So um, the consumerism argument that students come and say, I paid $50,000, thank God I teach at a law school where even out of district, people only pay $24,000. So I'm very proud of that fact that we're trying to keep legal education affordable. But yeah, a lot of students are paying $50,000 to come to law school. And they have very much of an entitlement sense of perspective on it. Anyone have that issue? Entitlements in your law school? Have you all found that your law students are here? Yes, give me rigor. Yes, make me work. Yes, make me realize I don't get to go out Friday night with my friends anymore because I need to do I agree with him. There, there is some students have a little bit of Some students do have a little bit Yeah, no, for years, um, a lot of schools didn't let people have their Westlaw or Lexus ID for the first semester so that they would learn print before they went on. Now a lot of libraries aren't keeping print up to date so they can do that. So, but, we, but with the cost and everything else, some libraries are <coughs> not doing that anymore. So, I agree. Some of our students come saying, I want to be a lawyer, teach me to be a lawyer. Some of our students have only an impression of law based on television. Not all of our students have grown up surrounded by lawyers, and a lot of my students, at least, are first-generation students, uh, law students, if not college, and they have a media perception of the practice of law, which then they're in for a very rude awakening when they realize it's not like that. Yes? Well, I know I found some students have that expectation that you know we should get high grades, no matter what we do. I think there really is an entitlement. So, you know, if someone gets a BB, that's just not really appropriate, you know. 
So I, I think there is a group of students on that, and I've also, in talking to students in the bar, they don't see, you know, many of the students are in the seven day operation, and they really have to think about it. It's, you know, okay, I'll, I'll study, but so, again, I think there is a large group that's feeling very entitled to the whole thing. It's a spectrum. Exactly. It's always going to be a spectrum. As I said at the very beginning, we're beginning with a lot of stereotypes and overgeneralizations, and we're always going to have people who go along the spectrum. There has been a growing, and some people say it's a product of the No Child Left Behind era that is now in law school where effort is sufficient, where every child gets a trophy, and therefore they don't understand why the fact that they tried wasn't sufficient, and they got a C. And oh my God, that is the end of the world because... Um, and who don't think they need to read a student handbook, that they think we should tell them all the rules, and then when they don't remember, well, you didn't text it to me. You know, I have students say, well, I don't read email, text me. Well, your judge or your lawyer or your partners are not going to text you just because you want to be texted. Bars have gone very progressive. They are now doing a great deal by email. But the fact that you don't do your email, you are still going to end up disbarred um, or, or malpractice, with malpractice suits because you didn't do what you had to do. So the fact that you are a product of I just go, that's what I do, I guess, tough luck. So yes, it's all a spectrum. And there is some entitlements and there is some yes, I want to learn. But again, part of it is goes to attention span, goes to learning style. If they are so visual rather than text oriented, should we be teaching visually? That learning theory tells us that we have to, as much as we possibly can, teach to the different abilities of our students. And you can, again, we're talking spectrum. You can do that in a class, and you can approach it with remembering the different learning styles that exist, and not everybody's showing up with the same learning style. And to get some generalizations of the students that come to law school, because Regardless, they've got an idea of why they're coming to law school. Maybe they think they're going to practice law. There may or may not be lawyers in the family, but they've got a little bit of an idea. So they do tend to have kind of a little bit of a focus of one kind of learning style. But they're not going to be all of them. Well, now that's a really interesting thing, and the. I actually make every student in my class take the bar test and learn their learning preferences before they walk in the door. I can teach a variety of ways. I have been part of the Cali podcast program since its inception. I podcast every lecture. So I do it. Personally, I find podcasts totally useless. I am a read-write person. I had to listen to an old podcast not too long ago to see if I could reuse it. I had to sit and take notes on myself in order to decide if, to, to really assess it. But again, I want to prepare students to go out and practice law. I want them to teach them to teach themselves. Not every professor is going to accommodate them, and nor can we ask every professor to, because not every judge and not every client is going to accommodate them in doing it this way. So what we need to teach our students is, yes, you may like all those pictures, so draw pictures. So take all that information and learn, understand it, synthesize it, make it automatic, incorporate it, take ownership of it by using your learning preference. I'll sometimes do charts, I'll sometimes do tapes, I'll sometimes you know, sing and dance, because yes, it keeps their attention, and when you have to teach in three hour evening blocks, you do anything to keep their attention, to keep them awake, I bring chocolate. But I also know that my job is not to teach them, I'm teaching contracts this year, my job is not to teach them contracts. The law of contracts doesn't change so much at the foundation, but changes at the spectrum. Yes, I want them to internalize foundational principles. Just like we want them in libraries, you want them to understand the concept of volumes versus page numbers in a reporter. Because without that, it's, it's kind of fundamental. You want them to have the base knowledge. But graduating law school, you don't really care about most of the detail. If they remember this law or that law. You want them to know how to teach themselves the law to go out and learn the next thing. The law that hasn't been created, the law that just gets passed, the one that they have to figure out themselves. And what can we do 
to take a, genera a generation that wants instant gratification, that's used to finding everything on a screen and sitting down and doing it all collaboratively, who don't want to have to do it all. What can we do to help them bridge the gap and recognize they're entering a profession that won't do that now? I'm glad you're, you're saying Um, but I think uh, someone said, said it best earlier that what is really important is that more faculty need to be they went to school or when they It's in the change. I don't disagree. You are absolutely right. So, but if you don't know the foundational 20x6, 26, 4, 6, 8 exceptions to hearsay off the top of your head, automatically, right. you won't get to make the objection you need to make. I am, I've been in law school for over a quarter of a century as a student and a teacher and a director of academic success. I am acknowledging that yes, the law and the practice of law is changing. I see it changing, I see technology coming in. But it's not replacing the foundation yet. It's supplementing and evolving. So I am totally on page with you that they need to learn that too. But learning just that is not sufficient because we haven't changed the old ways. We still have a case law system that's based on precedent. Is more and more of the law based on regulations and statutes instead? Yes. Between the time, um, as I'm from, I'm from a family of lawyers, okay? And at one point I had in the basement my grandfather's torts book, my father's torts book, and my sister's torts book. That was 1920 something, 1960, and 1981. I opened them all up and compared them. They're all the same thickness. Actually, the 1921 might have been the thickest with the smallest text and the least user-friendly in terms of that. I'm really glad to see that legal textbooks have gone to leaving more white space and maybe printing for those of us whose eyes aren't so good in a slightly larger font. Those are wonderful things, but the law my grandfather's textbook didn't have Paul's graph, which is the foundational case of torts and, and proximate cause. Right? It didn't ex hadn't passed yet. My father's textbook, just as big, didn't have strict liability. Hadn't passed yet. And my sisters had those. They all learned the same foundation of how to read a decision, of how to work with cases. A lot of vendors downstairs are offering case briefs to students. Here's one of the problems I see why students end up in academic success with me in trouble academically. They found case briefs. Oh, cool, that just saved me instant gratification, no time. I can sit down with my classmates, we talk about this case brief. They've never read a case or they've read it, but they haven't struggled with it. They haven't learned how to tear apart a case themselves. And then when they get to a class where there are no case briefs, or worse, when they get to practice, they have a problem. The bar exam, okay? Bar prep people have gone to accommodating the students. They no longer, they have every single one of them have caved and provided on-home study at home programs. So students can sit at home in their bedrooms or at their couches and do it at home. They can still go to classes, most of them don't because it's immediately not convenient. The vast majority of students who fail are the ones who try to do it at home and when you get them into a classroom to do it, or worked. The ones who are not working who fail are because they didn't really understand how much time is required. They did all their practice multiple tests for a 200 question, six hour MBE exam on a computer screen. Do you know what? That's not how the MBE happens. The MBE has not moved to online taking yet, okay? The DC bar finally went to allowing computers last July. Prior to that, if you wanted to type, it was a typewriter. 
That's July 2015. Okay, we finally persuaded them, they've done it, we're good. But do you know that there's actually practice that makes you better at bubbling 200 questions over six hours? And letting them do it online is harmful in their success on the actual practice on the actual exam because they get off one, they don't realize they actually have to bubble the whole thing and therefore they get graded off. Because, oh, it's stupid in many respects that how to fill in a bubble form is following directions is something most of them I have discovered are not really good about reading the student handbook. Now, I might not have been either, so I don't know that that's generational. But before I went to ask a professor A, B, or C, I did look at the syllabus to see if it was printed on there. They have it digitally, but they are so used to instant gratification. Again, I am globalizing and generalizing. I have many students on the other end of the spectrum that are great, they wouldn't do it, they come up and they apologize for that stupid question their classmate asked when it was right there on the second page of the syllabus. But again, all I'm talking about is what do we do? Um, what I believe is one of the most important things we can all do is transparency. Nothing to do with tech. It has to do with sort of what our keynote speaker was talking about this morning, which is experts versus novices. We forget how basic we have to get to explain it to them. They may just be trying to catch up and keep up, and whatever shortcuts they can find that helps them do that, they may do that because they also want the praise and the recognition of doing well. So I want to stop and say I'm not critical of them, and I know if people think that I'm, I'm denigrating. I'm not. I love students. I think they're amazing. And I think that sometimes they're really just trying to please me. You want an answer? Let me get you an answer. So I think that, as Rebecca was saying, we do as teachers, all of us, and all of us are teaching, whether it be teaching in the library, teaching technology, teaching in the classroom, we are all teaching. And as experts teaching, we forget that to them, a lot of this is a foreign language. The tech people know this, that when they have to go to someone who's never done it, that they can't just say, oh, uh, you know, put it in that folder. If someone's never used a computer, they don't know what a folder is. But when was the last time you took yourself back that far to novice stuff? What I did is I went and started taking classes in other disciplines. It's very, very uncomfortable. You know, that, that's really a good point about uh, that and what the spe keynote speaker was talking about this morning, that we tend to get set in our own expertise. Um, I, I was talking with one of the, our legal writing faculty members at, at my school, and we were talking about the Socratic method, and she acknowledged that she was terrified by the Socratic method. And, you know, she's uh, younger than I am, certainly, and I'm sure many of us probably felt the same thing, and many people have had quit law school because of the rigid application a la Dr. Kingsfield. <laughs> um, but and she made a great suggestion that it might be okay that we could learn a lot from digital natives by, by pulling them aside and saying, I noticed you had a little problem with the Socratic method, could we talk about it? Now, I don't know that we have all that much time to customize that individually, but to kind of have a conversation, instead of humiliating people, you know, students in law school, to embarrass them, maybe we could connect with them a little bit. I agree. I don't really want to humiliate or embarrass people. On the other hand, I'd rather they be embarrassed in my classroom than have that happen in a courtroom for their client. Um, my solution to that is I tell them all that when we get to a point and I call on you and you're totally unprepared, I don't want to humiliate you because you clearly didn't do the reading. So we have a word. I just look at them. My, my friend's 16-year-old daughter gave it to me a few years ago. We just look at each other. I just look and it's like, awkward, and move on. Okay? Everyone knows what I've just said. I've explained it the first day that that's going to be, you've just been let off the hook. I'm not going to humiliate you. I'm not going to leave you on the stand dangling like a Socratic fish. But I'm also not going to give you a pass because you didn't do what was required. And part of lawyering is attention to deadline, attention to detail, and you are taking other people's lives and livelihood in your hands. You can't not do it. If the judge gets up and is a pain in the butt or a 
SOB or whatever, or she is, you have to sit there as the lawyer and say, yes, Your Honor, no, Your Honor, and take it. I don't care if he or she is wrong. There are judges out there that we all disagree with, particularly in public press these days. But it seems to me that academia is a place where students ought to be able to make mistakes. Absolutely. And learn from their mistakes. Maybe when they're out there in the real world, the judges can, you know, and that's just how it goes. But in, in education, let them make mistakes. Absolutely, and, and how you deal with those mistakes is very key. So in addition to transparency, I've really been honing in on reflection. Okay? Because I think that reflection is a key to lawyering skills and learning skills. And one of the key ways to know, am I getting this, is to actually reflect on it. It's how expert learners get made. It's how expert lawyers get made. It's about thinking about thinking, thinking about what I did do, what I didn't do, what I could have done. And so one of the things I do is I tell students to write about it. Sometimes I collect the journal entries, sometimes I don't. But I think that reflection helps them see. And some of them give me a reflection that's two lines and it's nothing. And then I give it back to them and I say, really? Right? It's amazing what one word with inflection can do. You can't do it in an email, which is probably one of the reasons why I prefer a person, right? But I can say, really? Or I can say, really? And they get it. Right? So, but transparency, talking about it, getting them to say, getting them to be brave enough to say, Professor, what does that word mean? Or getting out their blocks right there on their computer, their digital, and looking it up, rather than just ignoring it because they were taught to speed read or they re-read by reading casually and they don't know that that and was key to the whole statute, right? Getting them to do these things. So these are totally non-digital, non-tech ways that we can help people in our environment to just have a conversation say, I, what I do when they come to me with the, set, the syllabus question is I say the answer is this and by the way it was on page two of the syllabus and next time I'm not going to tell you. Okay, I don't humiliate them, I give them, but I also say, hey, you can't do that. You can't go to the clerk of the court and say, when was my, my filing date again? You can't go to opposing counsel and say, I misplaced that piece of paper. Do you want to give it to me again? No. So it's about trying to find ways that we bridge students who seem to be coming from an undergraduate experience where there has been a lot more accommodating and less willing to hold accountable. And the question is, how do we hold accountable without humiliating? Because I agree with you. We don't want to humiliate our students, but we do want to hold them accountable. So I'm open to suggestions, thoughts. Seeing none, I dismiss you all five minutes early. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a great day. Yep, remember we're on live mic. Have you considered doing a, um, this is something that I'm thinking about, and I know you tend to provide a lot for your students. Have you considered doing a um, WhatsApp or a Zoom for your first year students where they can, like, post um, class, you know, ask? So what I, I use a, I use a front page, and I have forums that they yeah. can do whatever they want. They're that totally. Kind of fashion, though? You think about the the, uh, the digital natives; they want the answer right now, and with like a. a no, no, but there's a lot, there's a forum that they can just go. Anyone can open a forum and ask a question, and anyone can answer instantaneously by email. You want to do it by chat? Yeah, because I wonder if they're more likely to use it. I'm not. I'm totally exactly. you. If it comes to their phone and somebody asks yeah. a question, you know what was.
question is, I mean, I'd have to sort of think about the parameters. Do I want to be answering them or do I want to answer them? I don't want to answer them. But others could answer. I could answer or, like, I'll probably do that. Right, no, um, and I think it's really important to answer the question. Well, I'm going to say that 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 I'